Okay, um, thanks for coming. Um, this is going to be um, an introduction into compositional game theory. What, that, you know, what is actually compositional game theory? It's a new formal language to reason about games of um, strategic interactions. It was developed by several people, including myself, in a string of papers. Um, the central idea is, and the methodology, is based on category theory. Um, some of you might know what category theory is. Um, it's a branch of mathematics, and it plays a, well, a key role in some parts of theoretical computer science. So what's the central idea here? Um, it has something to do with compositionality, um, as you can probably guess. The central idea is that we start out by um, representing and modeling a basic building block. Um, we, we call it an open game. It's open to, an, to its environment. Um, you can think about it a bit as a pipeline, which some information goes in, some information goes out. And the idea of modeling using that tool is essentially that if you look at some complicated interaction, um, like a staking protocol, several, several players do something first, other players follow up, some computations happen in between. We are cutting these objects into pieces, and each of these pieces will be modeled by this basic open game. And if you think about it in the pipeline, then the idea is that once we have cut up things, we can compose it back into an, a bigger pipeline um, that represents then the model of the, of the situation that we're interested in. The other thing um, is that if we start out, let's say, with two components, we have ways of plugging them together. That object itself will be, a composite, will be an open game. So we can start out by very basic elements from the bottom up, model objects, put them into pieces, can reuse these pieces in the context of a bigger model. One of the central features of that approach, because we're using a methodology from, um, based on category theory, is that we more or less get a blueprint for an implementation of that theory. And, well, basically that's what we did. So we have a prototype in Haskell um, that allows you to represent games. It allows you to analyze these games in various ways. It's, um, we are starting to use it also for um, um, questions that are of interest for that audience, I guess, um, smart contracts and staking protocols. And I will, at the end, um, show a bit of how the tool actually works um, for a specific staking protocol. Okay, yeah, and by the way, this is also, um, we are thankful for the Ethereum Foundation because they have supported the development um, through a grant. What's useful about this, um, what it allows you to do essentially is, or it should allow you to do, it uh, should allow you to speed up the process of game theoretic modeling. Specifically, if you have not just one single model, but you might have a more complicated situation for which you need several aspects that you want to uh, model in, in separation, but are somehow linked, um, our idea is that the tool should enable you to be very quick in setting up these, these games. And because we are essentially programming, the typical things, you can reuse components. Um, you should be able to connect them to other stuff uh, and so on. Secondly, the language we design from, from an implementation perspective is designed so that every time you use it, you basically are guaranteed to end up in um, a well-defined open game, which means you just need, just, you just need to understand the language once you know that, you will end up in something that um, has a clear meaning from a game theoretic sense. Uh, obviously, if you model garbage, it's still garbage, but um, that's up to the modeler, essentially. Okay, once you express that object as code, you can reuse it, and you can make that piece of code, of course, input to other computations. Um, we have mostly focused on what you can call an interactive proof assistant. Um, essentially, you query a game, you propose, here's um, a strategy profile that I think is an equilibrium of that game, and then basically the Haskell compiler will tell you yes, or it will tell you no, there is a counterexample where one of the players has an, an incentive to deviate. More broadly, you can obviously do simulation. Um, you can integrate it also with automated testing. That's particularly useful if you think about a protocol which has several moving parts. Um, you might make changes over here. They are connected to this object here. And then you just have a battery of tests that you run anyway on, the, on this component to see is there some change happening that you didn't anticipate. The framework we use, the software, um, as also the theory, is actually also tightly connected to reinforcement learning. We have an implementation which connects that. So you have also all, all sorts of um, new ways of basically augmenting your analysis. All right, in this talk, um, I will focus on the modeling process from a high-level perspective. I basically want to walk you through you know, how does the modeling work? How does this cutting up into pieces work? Um, this is maybe beneficial. Um, and I will give you a little bit of theory background. Uh, I will not torture you with category theory, but I, it helps to give you some idea because, as I said before, the implementation very closely follows the theory. 
And if you understand a bit about a the theory, um, it makes it easier to, to understand what, what actually happens in the syntax and in the overall um, system. Okay, I will illustrate how to use the engine, engine mostly by focusing on how can we represent games and how to represent games, yes, and to, how to analyze it. This will be quick um, given the time constraints. All right, background. Um, so I said this already. The way to think about what is going on here is we are essentially defining a process language. We have this basic unit, which is the open game. And we have ways, if you think about a grammar, um, of combining existing object open games into new open games. Yeah? Similar, if you have a natural number, you add another natural number, you end up with another natural number. Here's the same. You have one game um, composed with another game. You end up in another open game. OK, what is nice about this, and that saves me a lot of trouble here, is the algebraic expressions are actually equivalent to a diagrammatic language. It's formally, you can, can basically um, go back and forth between the two, which is nice for me because I don't have to torture you with algebraic expressions, but I can basically show you diagrams and try to explain the intuition on the diagrammatic level. All right, let's jump in. So this is the basic open game. Um, again, think about it as a pipeline for now. So there's something going in, something going out. Now, the only thing which is a bit different to a normal pipeline is that there is information flowing in both ways, signified by X is an input, but also R is an input from the other side, Y is an output, um, and S is also an output, but these outputs are on different sides. So essentially what is happening is it's like a bidirectional information process. Something goes in from the left, and something um, comes out, comes from the, from, from the right-hand side and goes back. Time-wise, think about it as the side of X is basically the past, Y is the future. Okay, for now, or I said this before, D can be very complicated, could be a whole staking protocol basically inside, but for now, for simplicity, think about it as a single player making a decision. And making a decision means here she, um, the player is trying to maximize his or her uh, utility function. Yeah? Okay, what are these elements standing for? X essentially is the past. So if you, if you take the perspective of one player, you observe something about the past. It could be a previous move by some other player, it could be private information, it could be a computation. Your task as a player is to produce a move. This is why. So you're putting a move out. At the same time, you're a game theoretic agent. You're not just putting any move out, but you care about what effect will this move have on your utility. Um, to get this, we are basically expecting an R, you can think about it as a result, or a utility, or maybe you know, monetary values, back from the environment. OK, the key thing is, you see there is no loop or no direct connection between Y and R. So that means at the moment, at that stage, the player inside of that game um, can't really reason about what is the effect of choosing an element of Y, how does this actually affect me on my, on my direct utility. But that's the key trick, because later on we will stack this player into a bigger object, and then this connection will be made basically complete. And at that point, the player in G will maybe face another player after that, and you can think about if I'm choosing Y, of a certain kind, what will the other player react to it, given some strategy of the other player? Yeah. OK, I kept something out, which is the S. For the S, for now, think about it as a bookkeeping device. Namely, I said before, G could be stacked. There could be another game happening before. Now, naturally, the game before might need access to what am I actually getting back from that player G, right? And the S basically is keeping that information into the past. OK. Um, I said this, we are about, or we will basically build larger open games from smaller components. And what we need here are, if you think about it from a bottom level, so you have nothing implemented yet, um, what you need is a decision and a computation. There is more, but for that talk it will be, will be, suf will be sufficient. A decision is basically one single player. Um, a computation is, well, obviously a computation. Some input goes in, some um, output goes out. This can be effectful. Um, and it's obviously an important part if you want to model elements of a staking protocol, there are some computations happening that you need to be able to put into that, into that framework. Good, we have two composition operations, sequential and parallel. Let me illustrate that. Parallel, you can basically think about it as simultaneous composition. There are two games, G1 and G2. They happen um, here on the, on, the, on the plane basically in parallel. There is no direct connection. So they can have different inputs, different outputs, but I have a way of putting that into an own open game, again, having the shape that I showed initially as the basic unit. Um, and if, you, if X and Y and so on are just normal sets, then it's the obvious operation um, that you can guess.
good. Sequential, or se sequential composition, if I have a game G and a game Y, uh, sorry, a game H, I can also stack them, provided that the output of G and the input on the right-hand side are actually matching up to the elements on the, on the, on the game H on the left-hand side. And that also tells you that you're not completely free in composing any kind of games, but there are some restrictions on what sensible games you can actually form. Yeah? Previewing the implementation, if you think about Y, X, S, and so on as labels, they are essentially types. And in the Haskell implementation, they will correspond to certain types. Which means, if I give you a game H and a game G in Haskell, and the types don't match, Haskell will loudly complain if you try to compose them. And that's actually one of the one of the elements of the implementation which is quite useful, um, that it prevents you from forming games that are actually not well specified. Okay, yeah, that actually is the, uh, um, is the sequential composition. That's the way it looks like as a basic unit. Let me illustrate this um, with, one of the with one of the classics, the prison dilemma. Um, several things. So first we have two players, P1 and P2. Um, both of these players make a move, player one, Y1, player two, Y2. And then there is a glorified big block U, which is, um, well, a glorified payoff matrix lifted as a computation into the open games. There are essentially three ways of splitting that interaction up. Um, you could simultaneously separate player one and player two. And at the same time, you can also vertic vertically separate P1 and P2 from U. And another thing which is important here, you can see if you go to the left of P1 and P2, there are no wires coming in or going out. And on the right-hand side from, the, from U, there is also nothing going out. Yeah, so what it should tell you is not at, for all games it's necessary to feed in all the information. And for play, if you think about a one-shot prisoner dilemma, it makes a lot of sense actually because both prisoners, they don't observe anything about the past. There is no past by definition and there's also no need to send information back into the past. Okay, let me turn to the implementation. Um, so what we have is essentially um, a DSL embedded in Haskell and as I said this before, the constructions are guaranteed. If you follow the syntax, you will guarantee to be ending up with a well-defined open game. Let me first focus on how do we actually represent games. And that's important because I want to emphasize the modeling flow, which is, I think is a key thing of um, possibly a key advantage of the overall project here. Okay, right-hand side, you can see um, the, the diagram. On the left-hand side is the syntax. So this is using template Haskell, for those who know. You define it as the name of a game, that's the name of the game you want, and then um, there's a syntactic construction. The important thing to note is the following. There are these dashed lines, there's something happening in the internals of G, forget about this for now. There's the outside, which is the inputs, feedback, output, and returns field, and they ex more or less correspond to the information that are on the wires. Yeah. So you have some inputs, previous moves, you have some feedback, um, and you have some output, and you have some returns, and you have also the accounting of the S. Essentially, you can think about it as almost like an interface. That's the interface outside facing from the internals of the game that you will be reusing. Yeah. Okay, what happens inside? Well, basically, it's pretty close. Um, in a sense, there are the same four fields, inputs, feedback, outputs, returns. Um, you have these line blocks of five elements, and there might be more of them. And what happens is that you might need some information from the outside. Let's say there is some X, some previous move. You take that and you use it. Uh, but you might also ignore it. And of course, you might also create new information in internally um, of what is going on. The only thing which is different is the operation field. The operation field can be, for this talk, be three things. A decision, this case here. It can be a computation, or it can be another open game. So you can substitute in another open game. OK, yeah, and again, this I already said. Um, let me illustrate this with a prisoner dilemma. I hope this is readable. So this is, again, the, the diagram from before. First note, the outside fields, inputs, returns, and so on, are all empty, as I argued before. Internally, there are three parts um, corresponding to P1, P2, and U. And player one basically makes a decision. There is an output, which is in the, in the diagram, the Y1. There is also an expected return, R1. And then the same for player two, essentially. And lastly, the, um, the, the, pay, the forward function um, this is the operation lifting the payoffs PD, which is just a payoff matrix, basically into that framework. So that utility function is expecting the decisions of the players, and it's giving back to the players, um, essentially, the payoffs. Okay. 
Um, let me move on with beyond this very particular toy example um, to a staking protocol. I will not go into details. I want to illustrate one specific point, namely how the dividing up and the nesting works, essentially. This is um, one example of a staking protocol. And I start out by, as I said before, by cutting up things. So what could, you know, what could be a natural element? It could be, for instance, an attester. This attester here has some inputs. Um, there's some chain information, some ticker, some timer, essentially. And inside of that game, there's not much happening, um, except there is a decision. That decision is here dependent in the sense of previous information. There's an output, which is basically the decision that the, the specific player makes. All right. Now, I take that attester. I don't, I'm not just interested in one attester, but I'm interested in the groups of attesters, and I'm modeling that here. So here, that's another open game, same, obviously the same structure, with a bit more information. At the same time, I'm plugging in the attester from before as components, and I can be reusing it. There's a bit more happening down there. Let's ignore it for now. Um, I'm taking instead that attester group decision, and I want to make that part of one round of a protocol that I'm interested in. I'm plugging in it here, so I can reuse it at that moment. And again, there's a bunch of other things happening. You might note the first line block, so the first five elements inside of that thing are um, a proposer, and something else happens afterward. OK, maybe I'm not interested in one round only, but I also care about what happens if I play that game repeatedly. Um, if I want to put it into a Markov structure, essentially, well, I can reuse it as a one round and embedding it into a larger game, which is repeated. Yeah. So you can see we basically started out with a tester, grouped the tester into a group, took it into one round, and then took that one round into a repeated game. That's the overall strategy um, that makes it um, feasible to divide up a big problem into chunks. And of course, also, that is important, if you now start changing elements on the attester side, the rest can basically keep intact as long as you're not changing the interface. Yeah. Obviously, if you're changing the interface of information that the attester um, exchanges with the environment, you also have to change um, the other parts. OK, um, what can you do with that, actually? Let me illustrate just one use case. And um, I will basically leave the presentation for now for a second to illustrate this. Uh, so this is an interactive um, session in Haskell. I said before, one kind of analysis that we actually implemented is like a, um, a proof assistant. You have a game. You make a proposition. I have an idea, a hunch about what could be an equilibrium of that game that I'm interested in. Um, and then you can query it. Okay, I will not walk you through all of the details. That takes too long, but I'm basically um, going for one example here. Note this is called equilibrium two-round game. I said before we had a one-round game. Now, for whatever reason, I'm interested in what happens if I combine two rounds, sorry, one round into two-round games, taking the same component and looking at the equilibrium. There are a bunch of parameters. Um, I'm following a strategy that is actually following the idea of the protocol. And when I'm evaluating this, I get some output, which is just telling me, yeah, this looks good. Everything is in equilibrium, um, so don't worry. All right, if I'm looking at um, an alternative, so I'm manipulating the strategy. I'm not following the truthful strategy of the protocol, but I'm looking at something else. The output will look like something like this. Um, I'm getting a warning. Look, there is something wrong. Look at this specific player, and then you get a lot of information. Um, not that nicely formatted, but um, the idea should be clear. In that specific case, player one um, is not moving optimally. The optimal move should be three, which is a specific node on which you should build. Um, the current strategy is different. With the probability one, he's actually looking for or building on um, node one. Um, and you can see there is a payoff differential between optimal and current that makes it um, in a way that he should do something different. OK? That's one use case of how to use it. Um, I said before, you can also run some testing which we also do. There's a lot of stuff happening in that moment of extending this, also having simulation tools. Um, but for time's sake, I will not focus on that. OK, let me continue here briefly um, to basically conclude here. What we have so far is an engine. So we have a formal language um, that is actually also under active development or research. We have an engine in Haskell um, that we are using for all kinds of problems at the moment, which will be continuously extended. This is a new way of thinking and practical modeling, if you like. And as I said before, we are kind of actively working on all kinds of extensions of that. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Philip. It was a great talk.
not often we see Haskell at Ethereum conferences, but you know, sometimes it's nice to have a change. Um, is there any question from the audience? Uh, nice talk, thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, so maybe a uh, question a bit general. So um, from this representation that you get here of composing games, uh, do you see any things that get more complicated or less complicated? For example, do you win something on computing more easy, equilibria by decomposing? or by composing, does it get harder or any other things that uh, you have in mind and about what do you win or what do you lose in complexity from this uh, representation? Yeah, that's a very good question. So first of all, obviously, we, I mean, there are still existing results on the complexity that we, you know, we, there's no way of getting around it. Um, overall, obviously, there is a limit when you increase the complexity of the overall situations you're interested in. At, at some point, things might break down. Um, in practice, however, it is what you can do is there are use cases where you're not just interested in the overall thing, but you actually care about also components, but you want them to be consistent. In that case, um, you can actually focus on the components, and it's part of the modeler and possibly also at some point tooling to narrow down and to reduce the model, right? You can at some, I mean, because the model is not fixed. There is, there is choice and different degrees of freedom, it's specifically where you cut things. There's a lot of flexibility there, which certainly at some point for that specific problem might help you actually to be to be um, going in this direction. The other thing that I'm, I said before, there's a connection to reinforcement learning. The other thing that we are working on is some kind of what you, what you can call compositional numerics in the sense that there could be a numerics box in the, in the back which is internally optimizing what strategies to use actually depending on the shape of the overall game. That's something you could possibly in the future um, kind of leverage and gain from. We are not there, that's work for the future. Okay, great, great, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Another question? Okay. Oh, here. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Uh, great talk, very informative. Um, sort of the opposite of having a more complex scenario, I'll be curious if you have any plans for, you know, taking real input data to, for a simple scenario, give some kind of like empirical um, inputs instead of the problem with economics is often that um, <laughs> utility is very abstract and sometimes deviates from reality. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, so <laughs> on the, let me focus on the practical side. Can you combine that with data? Absolutely. Um, in, in fact, this is, you could even, you know, you, there's a lot of flexibility in thinking about it. You could even think about an open game as an estimator. Um, you're looking at data and you're trying to extract some information from it, right? The, the, I, I kind of mentioned this in, in passing. The, Agent in a game is here is focusing on a on kind of maximizing um, utility, but there is it's kind of a shape in which many things actually fit in, like learners, so that you can have an interaction of learning agents. And we have a first paper out looking on something else where you can do this. Um, and in that sense, you can first of all you can really think about learning in different different scenarios, not just maximizing. And you could, in principle, also start taking outside input and trying to inform the parameters of the game, including some utility or some kind of derived preferences. Obviously, from an economic perspective, that's not an easy thing to do, right? If you look at data and you try to infer um, preferences or some kind of goal function, that's a hard problem. It's, it works under constraints, but it, the constraints are typically hard. Yeah, but if you have a lot of constraints, you can model sure. it more accurately to a corresponding reality. Yes, agreed. And I think there are scenarios like if you think about arbitrage, um, where profit, for instance, is a pretty, pretty obvious goal function, um, and you don't have to think about esoteric things, um, then obviously it becomes easier because the constraint is, is quite, quite strong. Thank you. All right. Let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you.